Hello, and welcome to Risk Management Beliefs, the 35th episode in our Crossing Thin Ice podcast series brought to you by Actuarial Risk Management. My name is Max Rudolph, and as always, I'm joined by Dave Ingram. For risk management, we seek out those who not only talk a good game, but follow through with their actions. These are both important, but leave out a third component of risk culture that causes it to fail if not present. Nothing in today's podcast is intended to be investment advice. We are here to provide educational material on ERM topics for practitioners. We hope that you will also take advantage of our complimentary quarterly newsletter and webcast. Let's get started exploring the three components of a strong risk culture. A prominent business organization expert, Edgar Schein, tells us that culture has three primary aspects, what people say, what people do, and what they believe. Since the global financial crisis of 2008, regulators have been telling financial firms that they need to have a stronger risk management culture. And they went on to describe at length what management in a strong risk management culture would say and what management and employees in that strong culture would do. But they never mentioned that third element of culture, belief. So what happens? Risk management in many financial services firms became a compliance exercise. No one was asked to believe in risk management, and few do. When something is a compliance exercise, there are some parts of it that management says that they are going to do that they never get around to actually doing. Management of one firm that failed after recording a large loss from a risk where they far exceeded their risk tolerance was asked what the risk committee of the board said about that very high position. Their response was that while they had filed a risk management program description with a regulator that said they had a board risk committee, that committee had never met, not even once. No one at that firm was bothered by that omission because they did not believe that they needed a risk committee. When something is a compliance exercise, people may do something that is required by the regulators, but only when it does not interfere with achieving the real goals of the business. They believe that they know what to do to achieve those goals. The actual culture of the business is the things that the leaders say and the staff does because they all believe that it will lead to the success of the business. Forming or changing the beliefs is a slow and very deliberate process. I've worked at two companies that successfully went through a culture change and joined a third right after they had gone through one. In all three cases, the process was very similar. It required a constant focus from the executives to keep saying the new belief over and over again and to point out situations repeatedly when people in the company acted according to that new belief and especially when the results were a clear success for the new belief. The three elements were always there, say, do, believe. One thing that will stand in the way of a culture change is often the individuals who are the most successful under the old culture. They may feel that they must actively oppose the culture change, and management may feel that they must bend the new rules to accommodate them. That accommodation will be the death knell of the, of the culture change. A risk management culture is particularly difficult to install or change materially. If a company wants to change their sales culture, they can tell people to do something different, and then they can point to the successes th that are the result of that change. The successes will be tangible changes in sales, but the result of a working risk management system is often the absence of excess of losses, or maybe just losses that are smaller than competitors during adverse times. People are just not wired to pay as much attention to something that doesn't happen. Building belief in a risk management culture will require plenty of communication from executives about the risk management successes of staying within risk tolerances and limits and the resulting controlled loss environment that results. This will always be difficult to get enough airtime for those communications because the most senior executives have limited time for messaging and they also need to support the very important goals of sales and profits. This is why the chief risk officer needs to be a master communicator. They need to be able to tell the story of risk management successes and keep telling them without becoming a bore. If you are concerned about the risk culture of your firm, try thinking about the situation in terms of those three elements, say, do, believe, and how the company can get to the point where the employees do believe in risk management.
Are you challenged to meet your need for actuaries? Actuarial risk management can help. ARM's Data and Modeling Institute, or DMI, is a team of talented actuaries in Argentina with training and experience, working with an extensive bench of senior consultants. They will partner with you to outsource all or part of your actuarial and modeling needs to the DMI. The best thing, we do this at a significant cost saving to you while still positioning your company for tomorrow's challenges. Contact ARM today about our DMI modeling and valuation services. Let's start off with how, how do societal cultural differences influence people's attitudes toward risk and risk management? I'll give a couple of examples of that. Different societal cultures favor individualism, like our culture here in the, in the U.S., whereas in, in, in other parts of the world, in almost all other parts of the world, there's a, a more, more belief in a, in a more collective culture, and in some parts of the world, a very high degree of collectivism in, in, in the culture. In, in the individualistic uh, cultures, there's more accepting of, of personal risk-taking and, and also more orientation towards change and innovation. While in the collectivist cultures, such as uh, in particular many Asian societies, there's a, a bigger priority to group harmony and stability, and so they tend to be more cautious in their approach to risk. In, in addition, there's a uncertainty avoidance in, in some cultures. Uh, some cultures have a high tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty, while others like structure and predictability. And when you talk about the second type, countries like Germany and Japan come to mind where structure and predictability is, is highly valued. Uh, so they'll have more detailed laws and regulations to, to minimize risk. And, and then another societal cultural value might be short-term versus long-term orientation. Cultures with a, a longer-term orientation may be more willing to accept short-term volatility risk in, in return for potential long-term gains. And in cultures with a short-term orientation, like, like we're in the U.S., we pr prioritize immediate results and, and so may be more risk-adverse. So some of these things in the same places pull in different directions. So it, it, it could have a, a, a weighting difference between them. That's interesting. How do employees' attitudes towards risk impact the overall risk profile of an insurance company? I, I think they do it a little bit at the margins and that those little bits add up. So in the end, the, the, the risk profile of the company is just the sum of all the little day-to-day -day decisions that are made by all the individual division, de, uh, decision makers around the company. I, I think of it as every decision driving that processes of the company will either push to be a little more or a little less aggressive, sort of like as if you were rounding up or rounding down numbers when you're applying the rules of your job or whether you're just balancing the ups and downs. If you think of underwriting as a clear example of this, during the course of a week, the underwriter will, will see a lot of applications where the decision is clear, it falls right into some category or other. Uh, and, and so there's there's not a real tough decision to make. But they're there because there's also going to be a number of situations where the underwriter, underwriter's just, judgment is needed because the information puts the submission into a gray area between two different classes or between accepting or rejecting an application. So depending on the risk attitude of the underwriter, they might tend to accept those gray area submissions more often or reject them more often or to balance accepting and rejecting. And you add that up over time and, and all of a sudden the risk profile is skewed a little riskier or a little less riskier than, than it might have been. In addition, the attitude towards risk uh, has a, a big impact on their openness to, to changes. You know, mentioned that in the cultural aspect, but it's, it's there for individuals even within cultures where individuals might have risk attitudes that are, are different than, than what's predominant in their culture. But if you're going to have successful innovation and change in, in the company, you, you're going to need people that are accepting of that. So uh, if you have highly risk-adverse individuals who are less open to change, 
then they're going to be uh, dragging their feet uh, or actually uh, you know actively undermining change efforts so the uh, the risk profile won't change the way that you want it to on the other hand if you have individuals who feel that the environment is very low risk and, and they're willing to try anything and change you might see a volatile risk profile in that kind of situation following up on that Dave what factors would contribute to the variation in people's tolerance for risk I would throw the factors into two buckets. You know, the first one is their personal experience. So you you might say personal experience in terms of their personal lives. So each individual might have different experiences that way based on on their own situations and sometimes based on just bad luck. You know, they were the ones uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time. So if, 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 for instance, you're somebody that's been hit by a car, you'll be more cautious crossing the street. Another person who's never felt danger from a, a car going by will have a di very different reaction to that risk. Might not be able to know who's, who's which uh, because they may not say. The second factor uh, is the risk tolerance of the group that they're in. Uh, as much as we here in, in the US think of ourselves as totally autonomous individuals, humans are still very much social creatures. So we're highly influenced by those around us. That's why risk culture is so very important. Although it's not safe for you to have everyone with the same belief about risk, you need to, to be successful, you need to have the majority of people pulling in the same direction, aligned with the same risk beliefs and, 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 and with the risk tolerances of the organization. So I, when I'm saying the group, I'm thinking here of their immediate work group. Uh, but of course, the work group risk tolerance is influenced by the whole organization's risk tolerance to a greater or lesser degree, depending on, on how strong the uh, the individual leaders of the work groups are. You know, how can organizations identify and address conflicting beliefs about risk among their employees? Okay, uh, well, the, the main way they do this is by looking at outcomes. Uh, you can do surveys and ask people things, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily that reliable. Uh, people, when you do surveys of employee attitudes, uh, an awful lot of people tend to try and answer uh, how they think they want uh, management wants the answers to be. So you, you need to compare uh, uh, one group to another if you have similar groups that do similar things, uh, or you compare to the same group over time and see what kind of decisions they make and, and are those decisions staying consistent or are they drifting in some way. All right, so Max, uh, I've got a question for you. Is it a competitive advantage for insurers who do have a belief in, in risk management? I think it is. I, I believe when insurance is working, it's a win-win between company and policyholders uh, with a growing pie that works for everyone. But the comment back in 2008 from Chuck Prince of, of Citigroup right before the great financial crisis is, is still relevant today if we put ourselves in, in his shoes you know, where he said, when the music stops, in terms of liquidity, things will be complicated. But as long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. So in other words, if, if you want to be in the market, you need to be in the market all the time. Some practices today remind me of that time. For example, asset managers are taking, to me, what are excess risks. And, and you're also seeing social inflation driving up property insurance rates. Those who can survive during these crazy times will, will move forward stronger than ever. Uh, but the longer there's outside stimulus to the system, it becomes less market driven and harder for insurers with, with longer time horizons to succeed. I think Elon Musk is a good example to think about. I, I think he's brilliant, uh, but financially he takes a lot of risks that put his company's insolvency risk. And other firms have to match his practices or, or be deemed unworthy of investment. You know, we look at the market value of, of Tesla versus the market value of all the other automakers today, and you see this happening. It'll be interesting to view his, his retirement finances. Either it worked and he's very rich, uh, or he takes one bet too many and, and ends up penniless. So Dave, how do, how do you win over the, the people who push back against a risk culture change, or, or do you have to just move on from them? There's a lot of things you can do to win people over, and you have to recognize that it's going to be a, a long, slow process. 
if you're going to try and change any aspect of culture and, and particularly risk, because the best evidence you have to be able to, to communicate the importance of the new culture are, are examples of things that don't happen every year. The, the, the risks uh, that you're worried about don't cause big losses every single year. Uh, so you got to start out by communicating what this change is to folks. And when you're doing that, you do have to find, make sure that you take advantage when these learning opportunities do happen so that you can show that the new risk approach or the new risk mitigation approach, uh, how that works in action. Uh, you got to get employees involved uh, with this change. It, 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 it's got to be something that you're doing with them. Uh, so you need education and training programs. Don't leave it to everybody to work out for themselves. Help all the un employees understand how their roles and responsibilities are affected by the change. And most important to me is leading by example. Uh, leaders and, and, and managers need to demonstrate that they're committed to this new risk culture. Their, their actions and behaviors will have a significant impact on the organization and, and how everybody uh, either adopts or doesn't adopt uh, the new culture. It's helpful to remind even those of us who have been practicing risk management for a long time of the importance of believing what you say and do. A compliance exercise without belief is wasted time. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Crossing Thin Ice presented by Actuarial Risk Management. If you find it valuable, please like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues.